So today we are going to go over um, some different things that uh, about managing your research and gathering and evaluating sources because we are about to start on the um, literature review assignment. So that is something that's going to be due in March. Um, now that you have finished your topic essay, now you've got your topic all nailed down. So you're going to start looking at the different um, sources you might be using and comparing and contrasting them. Um, so I will say um, the reason I'm not gone full screen yet is because of this. I um, want you to look under the assignment sheets. Um, I'm not going to go over these completely in this video just because just for the sake of time, um, but I will be going over them in class. So make sure that you review these. The first thing that you need to pay attention to is your topic presentation is next week. Um, so it is going to be um, the 23rd and the 25th in class. So whatever day you normally come to class is when you will present, but you will have to have some slides. And so you'll turn those into the Dropbox by that Monday. So next Monday, um, you'll need to turn those in. And this is really just taking your, um, your topic essay and putting it onto like a PowerPoint slide. It doesn't have to be very long. I say about five minutes, um, about five slides and, um, you know, it's 5%, lots of fives here. Um, and it's going to be 5% of your final grade. So you just take the information, um, that you've got from your topic essay, and I'm going to, uh, grade those as soon as I possibly can for you. Um, but you're going to take that information that you, um, that you put in there and you're just going to kind of put it onto a presentation. So you're just going to be telling us, um, what your topic is, what your question is, why you think it's a, um, worthy of further investigation, how you chose it, and how you got it to a research question. So it's got these things right here. Literally, if you make a slide for each one of these questions or topics, then you'll, um, you'll be done. So it does, it won't take that long. Um, and you'll present in class, like I said, those days. So make sure you read over this, um, and go ahead and start preparing that. You really shouldn't be doing too much different work than what you've already, you know, you've already got the, um, the topic essay. So this is just turning into a presentation. Now, the other assignment that we are going to start working on is the literature review. So make sure that you look over this sheet. I'll go over it um, in class this week, both classes. Um, but it is going to be due on the 24th of March. And this is what you are going to be doing as far as um, this particular assignment is you're going to start doing your research around your topic and your research question. You're going to start finding sources. And you're going to take, um, you're going to choose three sources and you're going to compare and contrast them. So seeing what they say about your topic um, related to your research question. Um, do they agree on the issue? Do they disagree? How? Um, and all of that kind of stuff. So it's going to be three to four full pages. Um, this one is worth 15% of your final grade. And like I said, we'll go over this more in class, but make sure that you review this assignment sheet. Um, and it goes through, like I said, it tells you all the stuff that you need to do. Um, we're going to be learning how to um, research on... Um, why is this not wanting to work? There we go. Uh, we are going to be uh, starting to research on Galileo. I'm going to go over that um, next class and things like that. So um, once you start doing that research, then you can start leading in towards that literature review assignment. So um, you should have all turned in your topic essay review on Sunday. Um, and I will, I'm going to be out of town. I'm recording this early because I will be out of town that weekend. Um, but I will be out of town and will not get back into town until that Monday, the 15th. So um, I will comment and grade those as soon as possible. Um, definitely by the end of the week, um, hopefully by, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday. And um, so you can start working on your topic presentation. If there's any kind of changes you might need to make or anything like that, uh, make sure that you go over those assignment sheets. Um, and I will go over them in more detail um, in class this week. And your topic presentations will be next week. So you turn in the slides on Monday, and then you're going to present the day you normally come to class. Um, and also, just a reminder, make sure you're doing your quiz every week for attendance. All right, so you read in your book, hopefully, um, about managing your research. So 
research is always super duper fun. Um, and I'm sure everyone's really ready to jump in there and get to it. So um, this is just some information about scheduling your research and writing um, to look at that due date. So it's due on March the 24th and work backwards and figure out how, um, when you're going to need to find all your sources by, and then you have to start working with them. You don't want to wait till the last minute. So, um, you know, sometimes research can be overwhelming. And if you kind of wait till the last minute and you could just have way too much stuff or you can't find anything that fits the assignment, because there are particulars about the sources that you can use for this assignment. Um, you know, you don't want to wait till the last minute and then you panic over it. So make sure you set up a schedule and kind of figure out what steps you need to take um, and make sure that you're getting things finished on time. So that you can turn in your paper um, and have everything in there that needs to be in there on time. So um, usually it works best to divide your available time in half, half for the research and half for the writing. Um, that usually works out best just to give yourself plenty of time to find all the sources that you need. They're going to fit the assignment, assignment best. And then you have the time to read them and go over them and be clear about what they say and then start writing about what they, um, what they say about each other, um, what they say about your topic. Uh, make sure you're realistic about your schedule. Now, if you know, you, you know that there's some event happening, there's something on campus, there's a party happening, there's something with your family, you know, don't assume that you're going to run away from all that and be very di diligent and work on your research, you know. Make sure that you're realistic, that you uh, you know how long it takes you to find things, to write things, to organize things, and um, put, be realistic about the schedule that you know, you're going to schedule times to work when you're actually going to work. Um, it's also easier to break down major steps into smaller tasks. So um, you, know, you don't want to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to do all the research and write the paper all today because that's way too much to do. So breaking it down, we've talked about this before. If you break it down into smaller pieces, like I'm going to find two sources today, I'm going to find my other source the next day, I'm going to you know, read through this one this day you know that kind of stuff breaking it down to smaller tasks is going to make it easier for you to get that work done now creating schedule can be easy I love writing stuff down in a calendar and knowing when I've got to do stuff but sticking to it's a whole other thing um, especially when you have free time and you're at home and you just want to do nothing like kind of like I've been today so uh, making sure that you have that discipline to stick to your schedule uh, most people make excuses to procrastinate and unforeseen things can happen to throw off your schedule um, you never know if there's going to be some sort of um, Wi-Fi disaster, uh, technology disaster. If you know there's going to be, you might get sick is with all this, you know, COVID and everything going around. So you want to be um, as proactive as possible because you don't want to procrastinate and get to the end, and then you don't have enough time to to complete what you've got to do. That's um, I always like to get things done early. I, I am a bad procrastinator for the most part, but I've gotten a lot better about it. And I figured out that it, I, it's so much more relaxing to get things finished early and not have to worry about them any, anymore. I can relax. I can watch Netflix. Um, that's what I'm doing this, this afternoon. So then I can go the rest of my day and not have to do any more work. So um, keep a close eye on your schedule and your progress. Make sure you're sticking to it and that you are getting the things done that you need to have gotten done by that pertin those certain uh, points. Um, Put important dates in your calendar and set up reminders. Maybe you could use that, do that in your phone. Um, that usually helps me. Uh, I have Google Calendar. I have a dry erase calendar in my uh, living room. I have um, a paper calendar. I have so many different calendars to remind myself so I don't forget things. Um, using Pomodoro timers. I've talked about this before where it's like a timer that um, you can get an app on your phone that actually helps you with this, where it makes you work for 25 minutes, then take a five minute break. And you do that several times, then you get to take a longer break. So it helps you break down your work time into shorter little increments instead of saying, okay, I'm going to sit here and work for three hours because nobody wants to do that. I personally love post-it notes and checklists. I have lists everywhere. I've got a dry erase board next to my desk and I have a list of everything that I have to do. And I love erasing stuff off of that list. Um, and I have post-it notes everywhere sticking to different things so that I'll see them. And, you know, it makes me feel guilty sometimes. Like if I sit down in front of my TV or, you know, want to watch Netflix or something like that. And there's a post-it note sticking me in the face that's saying you have to write this. It's kind of makes me feel guilty. So it, that's my personal process. So you figure out what works best for you. 
Make sure you are anticipating your issues because things are going to happen. Um, it's not going to be super smooth the whole way. So make sure you give, give yourself enough time in case maybe the resource you want isn't available. You may click on it the first time and it works fine. And then you um, go to it the next time the link doesn't work anymore. Or you find a book in the library and then you think, oh, I'll just go check that out next week when I need it. And by the time you go and check it out, it's not there anymore. Um, so you may have to adjust and find some other source. Um, if you want to interview somebody, which is a way that, uh, that is, depending on the person, um, could be a good source for your paper, um, they may not get back to you. They may not, you know, they may not answer you at all, or they may cancel, or they may just ghost you. You don't know, and you have to find somebody else. Um, you need to change your thesis based on the research you've done. So you have this idea in your head that, like, this is my thesis, this is my research question, and then you start reading your research, and maybe it changes a little bit. And that may mean you have to go back and rewrite some stuff. So give yourself time to do that. The Wi-Fi could go out. The Wi-Fi is going to go out. Um, trust me. Um, the power may go out, you know, with storms and stuff that come through here. You know, the power goes out. Um, the Wi-Fi gets all messed up. You know, your computer crashes, God forbid. Um, you know, all of these things that could happen. Uh, you want to give yourself enough time to make sure that you get everything done. So um, if you need to find alternate sources or if you have to reschedule meetings, um, you know, if you work on your paper early enough that if you do have to change your thesis and rewrite some stuff, it's not going to set you back too much. Uh, make sure you keep notes on your sources as you go so you don't just go, okay, I'll just remember what this source is, um, and then you can't find it when you try to go back for it. Um, that's something that's important. Or when you have to use put your parenthetical citations in your works cited page and you don't know what the title of that book was, uh, you're going to be in trouble. So make sure you keep notes on, on that as we go. And we're going to talk about that today too. Uh, make sure you save your paper as you go. Um, if you use Word online, and I think Google Docs does this too, where it automatically saves as you go, make sure that you're um, doing that. Uh, that's another thing. If you use Google Docs or... Um, Word online, you know, if the Wi-Fi goes out or if their program messes up, then you may have trouble even working on your paper. So that's why you need to give yourself a lot of time there. Um, so just don't wait till the last minute because technology, you know, is not the most reliable thing. So talking about gathering your sources, these are the places you're probably going to find most of your sources. Internet search engines, Google, you don't want to use Wikipedia. Um, however, if you go down to the bottom of Wikipedia page, there's sources down there. Some of those you might be able to use. But if I see you quoting Wikipedia in your paper, I'm going to throw it against the wall. Uh, no, I won't really do that, but just don't do that. Um, library online catalog and online databases are going to be um, good sources as well. And we're really going to talk about this one um, in the next class, talking about going through Galileo and things like that to be able to find um, uh, it's kind of a combo of the online database and um, catalog this is when you're talking about actual books that they have books journals different things they have in the library versus um, articles and things that you can find through Galileo and things like that through online databases um, questions to ask about your sources. Is this source relevant to my purpose and is this source reliable? Now we're going to talk a little bit more about reliability today and in the next class. Um, but these are the things that you need to pay attention to because if it's not relevant to your purpose, why are you wasting your time reading it? Make it go away and find stuff that's you know going to work for your purpose. And it must be a reliable source. It must be an academic source. It must come from someone who knows what they're talking about, who has studied, who has written about these things before. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we got primary and secondary sources. Primary, what does that mean? One, first. So that is the direct first-hand source of information or data. That's... Um, Someone who's actually done the research, they've compiled the data themselves. Um, if you're talking about visual art, then that's the actual, and also includes books. If you're writing about like a literature text or something like that, the actual text or the piece of art that you're writing about is considered a primary source. Because um, that's like what you're, say for example, if you're writing about a movie, same thing. That's the primary source. The movie itself is the primary source because it's the basis of where you're branching your research from. Um, historical documents like speeches, letters, diaries. Um, think about using things like that as your sources, not just journal articles and things like that. You know, we've read a couple speeches. These are direct words from people who have lived through events, who were there at events, um, and that can be considered a primary source because they're actually there. They had, you know, experienced it. Um, autobiographies, memoirs, interviews, and other personal accounts. Now, autobiographies, memoirs, interviews, those kind of things, is those are words coming directly from that person. 
Um, so that's why it's considered a primary source as opposed to a biography is considered a secondary source because it's written by a second person. Um, so think about it just comes directly from the source that's primary. If somebody's writing about a primary source, that's considered a secondary source. So in other words, it's one step removed. Um, that's the difference between a movie and a movie review, for example. So the movie is the primary source. Somebody writing about the movie, that's a secondary source. That's just them analyzing it themselves. So um, that can be considered literary criticism, biographies, reviews, documentaries. Um, documentaries are good sources too. They're talking about um, different people and events and different issues, but um, it's a good, it's pretty much like reading a journal article, but you get to watch it instead. So, I mean, you can use those as sources as well. News reports um, where you're, you know, somebody's showing up later and going, this is the story that happened. Um, that's considered a secondary source. You want to focus more on the uh, primary sources as much as you can, um, but you are going to have some secondary sources in there as well. So popular versus scholarly periodicals. So popular newspapers and mass market magazines, those are written for a more broad audience. So those are the things that you're mostly going to find um, magazines and things um, that, you know, that you see on a regular on a newsstand. Um, but scholarly journals, scholar, scholarly periodicals are written more for a smaller audience, more targeted audience, people who are out there to study the particular um, subject that they're covering. So it's a difference between, you know, um, reading Cosmopolitan versus reading Psychology Today. You know, it's specifically for Cosmopolitan is just for anybody who wants to read it. Very mass market, very general audience versus Psychology Today is specifically for people who are studying psychology or practicing psychology. And you're going to want to look for those scholarly periodicals. That is what you need to focus on. Um, you need to find, I mean, there are, and I can help you find this. I have an entire book that talks about the, I mean, they have um, journals and periodicals that are targeted to people who own boats, people who um, run hotels, people who cook, people who, you know, like different things like that. So, and not just like cooking, but chefs, there's a difference between, you know, eating well and like a chef magazine, that kind of thing. So um, think about stuff that's going to be specifically targeted to people who are studying the, the issue and the topic that you have chosen. So um, the aim of a scholarly journal is to inform when the, you're thinking about mass market, um, just general magazines, that's more for entertainment. Um, and it will be more of a, uh, the scholarly journal is going to be more of um, unbiased and um, very formal, which is the way you're going to be writing as well. Uh, it can they can also provide in-depth information unavailable elsewhere because it's peer review. So, you know, you work on peer review in class. That means people uh, of your same status are, you know, in the same class are looking at your work. Peer review when it comes to a scholarly journal means like, say, for example, we said psychology today. Other psychologists are going to review that information and go, yes, I agree with that or no, that's not actually true. So it's not just somebody writing a story and going, here you go. It's my story. Um, People are actually, you know, checking them and making sure that their research is actually correct. So sources on the open web, you need to be very cautious about these. Free resources, you can find a lot of stuff through Google, um, Yahoo, An don't go to Yahoo Answers, there's some crazy stuff on there, um, Reddit, you know, things like that. Um, web pages, um, Wikipedia, different blogs, forums like that, there's a lot of them out there, but for the most part, they are not peer reviewed, which means I can post whatever I want to on there, which means it is not a reliable source. So many of the sources are free, and they're created and revised by a large group of users. In other words, you know, Wikipedia, I can go in there and edit any page I want to, and I can put whatever I want. Uh, until somebody catches on to it, that's what it's going to say on there. Um, so it's not a reliable source. Um, these sources can be good at starting, a uh, good starting point. So like I said, Wikipedia, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, uh, there should be a list of resources there. Some of those resources might be a primary or secondary source that you could use. Um, so, you know, it might be a good place to just, when you do a general Google search for your topic, um, you can possibly find things. Then you go to Google Scholar and do a, uh, a search for... Um, things like that, then you can find even more scholarly resources. So, drawbacks of open web sources. The results do not consider the reliability of sources. Um, usually because the first, the, the hits that come up at the top, um, they, sometimes they pay for it. Yeah, you know, some 
places. They do certain things to optimize, optimize you know, their search uh, results, that kind of thing, to make sure that they're at the top. Doesn't mean that they're the most reliable. Um, so you can't always trust that. Um, and, you know, maybe based on, you know, sometimes an ad pops up is the first thing. Um, that's not going to be a reliable source. Somebody's paying to have that information put there. And they're doing it so that people will um, will buy something from them, probably. Um, and plus, you know, if something's been clicked on, usually your Wikipedia source is the first thing that's going to pop up. And people are clicking on those more. And the more you click on something, the higher that goes up in those search engine uh, results. So it doesn't mean that it's reliable. It just means that it's popular. It does not mean that it's correct. Um, you know, they say the most popular thing is not always the right thing. Um, that goes for uh, open web sources as well. The results may be too numerous for you to use. You have to learn how to kind of break down and narrow down what you're trying to say because, you know, um, you can search for something and you get pages and pages and pages of results. And the thing that you might actually need may be on the sixth page. How many of y'all actually go to the second page of, of searching? I never do. Because um, if it's not on the first page, I'm like, well, it must not be reliable. So you, we have that in our head that it may not be the right thing. Um, so that's why... It, with all those results, you need to learn how to narrow down your search. The um, results also may not include the library's high quality electronic resources. So we're talking about Galileo and things like that. The library and the university pay for Galileo and they pay for us to have access to all these journals and things um, that you get the option and you get the opportunity to use while you're here because um, it's part of your tuition. And so it's something you don't have to go pay for. So that's going to be, you know, higher quality than just finding something on Google. Because anyone can publish anything on the web, the quality of information varies greatly. Um, so you need to make sure that you evaluate your web sources carefully. And we will talk about that probably more in the next class. So best ways to use open sources, limit your results to websites that have been updated within a particular time frame. There's a way to do that. Um, you don't want sources from you know, a long time ago. You want the most current source that you can get because you're talking about current issues that are happening today. Um, you can also limit results by language or region if you're talking about a particular region of the country or the world. Um, you can limit results to scholarly work. So if you use uh, Google Scholar, then you can do that and everything that pops up there should be something that's peer reviewed and be considered academic and scholarly. Um, you can also limit the results by file type so you can get full text PDF articles rather than just a web page or something like that. Um, that make it easier for you to download it, to print it, to read it, that kind of thing. You also want to limit your results to a particular site or domain type. Um, usually .edu, which means a school or university, is going to be a very reliable source. .gov, um, usually government sites, those are um, usually highly regulated, so they're going to be more reliable. Um, .com is, you know, could be, may not be. Um, .net, mm, probably not. Um, .org is usually pretty good. It means that it's going to be a, usually a nonprofit organization or something like that, but there may be bias there because they are trying to get you to be a part of their organization or to utilize their organization. So they may almost kind of be selling it to you a little bit, so you have to consider the bias that they use there. Um, so these are some different, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just some different types of sources that you can find through the library. So they got referen reference works. This is like encyclopedias and almanacs and books, things like that. Nonfiction books, like we're talking about memoirs and trade books and things like that. Periodicals, um, newspapers, magazines, academic journals, government publications. Those are something that be, like I said, you know, they're highly regulated. So they're going to be um, fairly reliable. Business publications, so things that are geared toward nonprofit organizations that address a certain issue. Um, different things like that are always good. Documentaries, like I said, it's pretty much like, like it says here, the moving image equivalent of nonfiction books. So instead of if you don't like to sit and don't want to read a whole book about an issue, you can watch a documentary and an hour and a half later, two hours later, you may have some really good quotes and really good information because they've done the research and then they've presented it to you. These are some different databases that are available through the library through Galileo. So these are some different ones that you can use. Um, as a paralegal, I used to have to use LexisNexis a lot. So that was a lot of things having to do with legal issues, things like that. Um, but there's a bunch of different, these are all really good databases that you have access to just purely through the library. So you can use these to find your information. 
if you don't know where to start, ask a librarian. There are different ways to talk to them. You can email, you can text, you can chat. They have, um, if you go to the library website, they have ways to, um, to talk to them. You could just chat through the website. You can text them. You can call, email. There's, it's open, you know, certain hours you can go over there because they are going to be the ones that know what information they have and where it is. They know way more than I do about what they've got over there. That's their whole job. They know where the info is and they can tell you where to go. Um, so you can go, hey, I'm doing a paper about this particular subject and I need some help. And they can go, hey, we've got this journal. We've got this. We've got these books. You know, they know where all the stuff is. So utilize that. Um, so then once you find sources, evaluating and processing those, um, thinking about if the source is relevant. So how are you planning to use it? Um, what question is it going to answer? What point in the essay are you going to support with it? Um, and then is the source timely? So think about based on the topic, um, the example they use is technology. You know, if you, you probably don't want to write, you know, use a article about cell phones from 2002, like that's, you know, plus the, the, first of all, they'll be calling it cell phones, uh, which no one does anymore. So think about those kind of things. Is it timely, timely related to your topic? Um, and you want to find the most recent sources that you can find. Um, see when this website was last updated. So do the links still work? If the links don't work anymore, that probably means that that information is not good. So weed out unhelpful sources. You, you can skim over them. If you, you see a whole book or a whole very long article or some of them that aren't that long that y'all still don't want to read, um, skim over them. Start reading, you know, read the table of contents, scroll through um, or flip through and look at anything you see in bold, like the titles of chapters, the titles of sections in an article, different things like that. Um, use an index uh, that you can possibly find. See if they talk about specific topics that you are trying to talk about. Um, so skim over them. Just kind of flip through them, look through them really quickly and look for certain keywords that you're looking to that are related to your topic. Uh, and that can help you so you don't have to read word for word to find out the information if the information is in that particular source. Continuing on if this source is reliable, how thoroughly does the writer cover a given topic? If they just kind of skim over it and they just um, give you the basics, then you probably want something a little more in depth. How carefully do the writers research and document facts? So they, they could be doing their own research. They could be quoting from other places that, you know, other people that have done this research. Um, how do editors review the work? If it's not edited, if there's not somebody who reviewed it before it went out, it is not reliable. Do not use that source because I can write a blog all I want to and write whatever I feel like. If nobody else has looked at it and said, yes, this is good, then it's probably not reliable. Um, what biases or agendas affect the content? Are they trying to sell you something? Are they trying to get a point across to you? Are they trying to sell you a point of view? Um, think about that. Or are they being unbiased and they're just saying, look, this is an issue and these are the arguments and just presenting it to you um, in an unbiased way. What's the credibility of the author and the publication? Who is the person that wrote it? And um, do they know what they're talking about? Have they studied the subject? Is the publication something that is um, reliable, that you can trust? It's been around for a long time, that kind of thing. What is the author's purpose or objective for presenting the information? They're trying to present it to sell you something or um, to convince you of a point of view, then it may not be as reliable as somebody that's just presenting the information for you to figure out, you know, for yourself how you feel. Does uh, does you believing the information benefit the writer organization in any way? In other words, if they convince you of their point of view, are they going to get something from you? Are they going to get your support? Are they going to get your money? Uh, if that's the point, if that's why they're putting out that information to get you to join them, then that may not be a reliable source. So different types of sources. we got high quality sources that provide the most in-depth information. Those are written and reviewed by subject matter experts, people who have studied, who have spent a lot of time writing and researching that particular issue or topic. So books published by university presses and articles in scholarly journals, trade books, magazines, um, something that's targeted toward an educated general audience. Those are the best high quality sources. Very quality sources are often useful, but they do not cover subjects as much uh, in as much depth as high quality sources. Um, they may be more looking for entertainment value uh, or just to kind of give you a real general knowledge rather than being in depth like the high quality sources. 
So that's more like popular magazines versus scholarly magazines. Questionable sources are often written primarily to attract large readership. They're just trying to get people to read them. They're just trying to get clicks. That's all they really care about. That's when you think about some of these magazines like Us Weekly and um, OK and where they put these um, these kind of salacious headlines and they just want you to click on it, read it. Like that's a questionable source if they're just trying to do it for entertainment value or they're trying to sell you something. You have to really think about that. Now, once you start finding those sources, you better start keeping track of them so you don't lose the stuff that you want to use. So it's important to keep track of your sources, take notes as you go, make sure you're listing the titles of different um, articles or journals or books or the web pages that you're on so you don't have to go through the whole search again and try and find them again. Writing down all the information you need for your works cited page as you go is going to save you a lot of time later too because you've got to, if you're using that source, it has to be on your works cited page. You can't say, oh well, I, I got this quote, but I don't remember where it's from. And so I'm just not going to put anything on the works cited page. That is considered plagiarism and that will get you a zero. So make sure that you are writing down that information as you go. So this is just a list of some of the info you're going to need for your works cited page. So depending on the type of work it is, whether it's um, work in an anthology, um, a book, periodical, uh, online source, different things like that, this is the information you're probably going to need to put on your works cited page. So it's important to take notes of those things as you go. Um, so there's different ways that you can take notes on your sources. It depends on what works best for you. Using index cards, if you write each one down on a different index card, then you can organize them how you want. Uh, make a stack of them by the order in which you're going to use them. That's what I had to do when I wrote my term. That's we were required to turn in our index cards when I was in 12th grade for our term paper that we wrote. Um, you can do it. Kind of, or notebook is pretty much the same as index cards. You're just listing the stuff down. You just can't rearrange it like you can cards. Um, annotate your sources so you can write your notes. Like if you print out your sources, you can write notes in the margins. You can highlight things. That's something that you can do as well. There's also such thing as note-taking software. Um, Evernote is one that I use on my computer where I can save whole web pages to an online folder, and then I can just go back to that folder and find it so I don't have to research for all that stuff. Pick which one works best for you. Um, and then you're going to use those sources in different ways. Now, we're going to talk about this more later on, but you once you start using it in your paper, you're going to be using, you're going to either be summarizing it, paraphrase, paraphrasing it, or using direct quotes. Now, you may want to write down these different things as you're taking notes on the sources that you could say, okay, I'll get, do a summary of this. Now, summarizing is where you're taking a huge piece of information, say, for example, an entire article and you're making it very short you're telling me like this is the these are the main ideas of this entire article and you tell it to me in a sentence or two versus paraphrase is going to be putting things in your own words but it's going to be about this you're going to take a smaller piece and it's going to be about the same length as that piece once you put it in your own words so it um, helps you think through the concepts the writer is discussing when you're thinking about putting it in your own words. Now, a direct quote is word for word, the exact wording. Um, so those are the three different types, ways that you can do that. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to work on that more as we go through because we are going to be um, working on this assignment in class a good bit between now and when it's due in March. Um, so if you have questions, we are going to start working more on the research pretty soon um, so you'll be able to use these skills here so um, assignments make sure that you do your quiz um, review those assignment sheets for the topic presentation especially the topic presentation because that is next week so you want to go ahead and get started on that um, because you are going to be um, turning those slides in on Monday next Monday and then you're going to be um, presenting in class and you'll just stand up there and I'll use the slide I'll pull the slides up from the D2L Dropbox where you've turned them in and I'll just click through them and you'll stand up there and explain you know what's going on so it'll be very short very painless um, it's really just uh, I'm only grading you really on the fact that you know that you're presenting the information not how well you present it or anything like that just that you're getting the information across that I ask you to get across um, so if you have any questions, make sure that you uh, ask me, you email me, you call me, you text me, um, and I can answer the questions and help you as best I can. So um, just let me know.